higher education. Thank you so much for that, Professor Saka, and for setting the scene. And I have now the pleasure to introduce you to our moderator for today's panel, where we want to dig deeper. And um, she's actually the chief of the Knowledge Advisory Service Center here at the ADB, a medical doctor and public health expert by training. She's also a senior innovation, knowledge management and future thinking expert. So you will be in good hands for the panel on the future of higher education and digital transformation, the impact of MOOCs. I hand over to Dr. Suzanne Roth. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joost. Um, it has been a pleasure to listen to Professor Saka. And um, I think you set the stage very well for a very technical discussion today, but I think also a quite philosophical discussion. Um, we as futurists, we um, sometimes say the future is arriving faster than we think. And um, I believe the last 18 months have confirmed that. Um, trends and emerging issues that we've seen before, especially in higher education and the technology in higher education have been accelerated. So I'm sure that our panel will be very excited to share the silver lining of the pandemic and uh, share with us how technology in higher education is gaining more tractions and share some of these examples. So um, before we start and before I introduce the panelists to you, we would like to do a quick poll. So if I can ask you please to, um, uh, to share the poll questions with us uh, from the, the organizers. Um, the questions we want to ask you is really to identify from your perspective, key challenges for higher education institutions post the COVID-19 in developing countries. And please think about what you think are some of the most critical challenges. So this will put us then into the right kind of um, uh, frame of mind for our discussion. Okay, let's see what kind of responses we are receiving here. Uh, it's coming in. Okay, that's very interesting. So yeah, I think that's a very good point, especially for us as a um, development bank. Um, most people see the lack of resources and capacity to engage with more research and development activities as a key threat, but also teachers' readiness for digital education and the competences. Um, and um, I think what is great to see is that you see um, less of a risk in um, in students' behavior. You use you 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 seem to see that students are very open. They're embracing massive open online courses and open educational resources. Um, and uh, actually having two teenage daughters who've been learning online for the last 18 months, I confirm that. It seems that um, young people are very uh, adaptable and they do embrace um, technology and education, especially also in higher education. So, okay, so I think um, now we have a front runner, which is really teacher's readiness, which comes back to capacity. So I think we can see um, what we hear from the audience is lack of resources, and capacity to really embrace new kinds of higher um, of technology in higher education, and then really the teacher and professor's readiness. So I suggest um, we move now to the experts and uh, hear from the experts what they see and what they're doing already. Um, it's always important to actually hear practical examples and not just talk about the theory. So I would like to introduce now our experts to you, um, who we have here. It's a, it's a very interesting uh, group of, um, of people. So first, uh, please let's welcome Ha Wei. He's the Associate Professor and an Associate Dean at the Peking um, University. And um, he will talk today uh, about his work on evaluating um, higher technology in higher education. Um, after Hai, um, Harvey, we will talk. We will hear from um, Yun Mok Na. He's the president of the Association of Software Centered Universities, and he will share some of his experience and work, especially also working with industries. And then we will hear from Ibu Paulina Panen. She's the chairperson of the Indonesia Cyber Education Institute about her work on sharing 
um, online courses and expanding the program in uh, technology in higher education. And then we will hear from Fang Hock Kwat, who will demystify how we can develop ecosystems around technology in higher education. So you can see we are moving from reflection evaluation to very practical examples, and then probably we'll end with um, cutting edge um, experiences uh, building ecosystems around um, around uh, uh, higher uh, technology and higher education. So if I can now please invite Professor Ha Wei to share how we can build the university industry cooperation and reduce. Okay, thank you very much. We are back again. Um, sorry for the interruption. This was a, a small technical glitch, but I think we are all used to that. So if we can now invite, please, Professor Ha Wei, who will talk about how we can build university industry corporations and reduce the mismatch between industry and universities. It's a problem we see everywhere um, in developed countries and in developing countries. So we are very eager to hear from Ha Wei. Over to you, please. Thank you. Thank you, Sudan, for the nice introduction. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Hawei, Associate Dean of uh, Graduate School of Education, Peking University. The title of my presentation today is Improve University Industry Cooperation, Why and How? First of all, why do we need to improve university industry cooperation system? Because there is a huge gap between the capabilities, the education system enable people to develop and uh, what employer needs these days. This uh, figure shows you, according to a McKinsey 2012 report, uh, across uh, surveying uh, 4,500 4, students, uh, 2,700 employers, and 900 education providers across nine countries in the world, that they find that um, uh, only 50% uh, of the young people and the employers is that um, or less than 50% of the young people in the employer says that uh, they are uh, ready for entry level jobs, meaning the graduates. Whereas the education provider believes 70%. It seems the uh, employers and, and education providers live in parallel universe. And um, why is that? It's because lack of uh, interaction. You know, over two thirds of employers say they ha have little or no interaction with the education systems. And among those who, who say they do have interaction, more than half says the interaction is not very effective. Well, if you think uh, McKinsey report is not uh, authoritative enough, let's look at World Bank uh, literature review of 28 studies, uh, three uh, global studies, six uh, regional studies, plus 19 country specific studies. The basic finding seems to uh, echo what McKinsey has found because there is a greater need for social emotional skills from the employers. There's a greater need for social emotional skills and higher order cognitive skills than for basic or technical skills. Maybe the universities or our education system in general are more uh, uh, adept or more um, uh, skillful in producing those basic and uh, uh, technical skills. And employers perceive that the greatest skill gaps are in social emotional skills. And it's the same story in China. Um, this is a study by Professor Ma Yongxiang from um, Beijing Technical uh, University. And she, in her survey of uh, 270 employers in seven industries, she found there is a gap also between the perception and expectations of enterprises on students 
uh, abilities or capabilities across different dimensions. And um, except with uh, general or, or it's probably equivalent to the basic uh, cognitive skills uh, in earlier studies, except for those basic skills or general abilities, there is also a gap between what the industry needs and what industry perceives that the young people enjoys upon graduation. So why employers have little interaction with the education system? Um, we can go back you know, half a century and look at Nobel laureate uh, Gary Baker's theory on human capital. In his theory, he outlined that uh, firms will not be interested in providing general, you know, general training because general training increased the future marginal productivity of workers not only in the firms providing the training, but also in other firms. Firms would be interested in providing firm-specific training because that kind of training has no effect on the productivity of training uh, of trainees in other firms. Therefore, the willingness of worker or firms to pay for specific training will depend closely on the likelihood of labor turnover. So firms are very much afraid that uh, other firms will poach the workers uh, you have, um, it has trained, um, and then it's created a free riding problem. But you may ask, or many people actually in the development field would say, oh, let's adopt the dual training or dual vocational training system from the, from the germ, from, um, Germany. But this uh, kind of uh, training system or the training ecosystem has evolved over time from a specific economic culture and the political background. Both Germany and uh, Britain, and in fact, as a general case across Europe, the roots of uh, vocational training can be traced back to the guild system from medieval Europe. These guilds control the skilled labor through a system of apprenticeship, whereby any person who wanted to be a craftsman would train under the supervision of a master with a period of around seven years so that they can gain freedom of practice. Guilds were, were extremely important aspect of Middle Evil society as members often form a tight knit community. However, ruling governments saw guilds as a threat to their power as they exert significant control over political and economic affairs through lobbying and the ability to influence labor market. After the Industrial Revolution around the 18th century and the introduction of complex machinery, there came an increased need for vast amount of low-skilled labor and less of need for high-skilled labor. Several acts in the mid-19th century granted freedom of the trade to free masters who had no relationship with the guild and remove the guild status as a public institution. However, there now existed a huge working class who were united through working, worker organizations and simple class dynamics, giving rise to a socialist upheaval. The Wilhelmian government responded to this pressure by reintroducing the protection for guilds and high-skilled craftsmen. In comparison, the Industrial Revolution was born in Great Britain and the extent to which economic liberalism influenced policy was most severe there. Training was poor or even non-existent and only carried out on a job-specific basis. The socialist influence on German social, social uh, policy would eventually lead to attempts to create a more expensive education system. George 
Kirchensteiner was a very influential educationist in Germany who saw education as a tool to imbue students with a set of moral and civic values, which would create loyal workers and per perhaps dissuade citizens away from mass protest. Thus, the very roots of uh, German Tibet system are connected to a concept of vocation, which goes beyond the classroom and frames vocational learning within the broader nation, broader definition of nation, uh, national provide and civic uh, duty. Schooling became mandatory in 1938 and the vocational schools become much more widely accepted. Private enterprises were encouraged to participate by strong state protection and a strong voice for trade union in trading design. This movement within German education would gain momentum as other 20th century political regimes capitalize on the social being aspect to promote stability and the national identity. And by 1969, the dual system was legally ratified through the Vocational Training Act. Today, the dual system in Germany still enjoys a strong attendance figure in Germany and constantly promoted by bilateral donors and multilateral donors uh, as, a, as a solution, as a panacea to solve the university industry um, cooperation problem. But uh, Professor Lewis summarized uh, this uh, uh, kind of uh, experience, um, not, not uh, this kind of mismatches, because um, when you try to adopt a training ecosystem, from another culture into other culture or societies, you are bound to have different types of uh, mismatches, institutional mismatch, cultural mismatch, sociology mismatch, and power uh, mismatch. And this kind of mismatch not only happened in the developing world, it also happens in the developing world. In the late 20th century, the British government attempted to institute features which would allow them to replicate German due system, but this was not possible due to a cultural mismatch, whereby British private enterprises lacked the training culture to effectively adhere to the standards laid out by the planners. Policymakers in the United States consider implementing a due system, but this sparked a debate about the suitability of such a system for American demography. Some felt creating such a pathway would deepen pre-existing racial inequities, thus making the US an example of a sociological mismatch for the dual system. So what can we do? In today's um, presentation, I'd like to uh, propose a seemingly more general solution to this uh, free ride, free riding problem or uh, public goods problem. And I call this an uh, education balance sheet of enterprises or even individuals. Because in the past or, or currently, individuals who receive higher education or enterprises, high tech enterprises or bigger enterprises, who hire a lot of highly skilled laborers. They pay taxes, right? They pay the salaries of those highly skilled, and then they retain the rest of the profits. For individuals, they pay for their higher education, but they only cover part of that cost. Therefore, these individuals and enterprises who hire them, their employers, enjoy a huge public subsidy. In this education balance sheet uh, I propose, hopefully we can measure the public subsidies each and uh, every individual and enterprises enjoy. And we use that as a benchmark for how much the enterprises and the individuals need to input or need to contribute to the building of a, a skilled 
development ecosystem, a skills ecosystem. Individuals can become part-time teachers uh, and uh, enterprises can donate to education institutions. They can provide innovative learning content and or they can offer internship and training opportunities. Remember, in the past, the firms would not want to invest in general skill training uh, because of their free the labor turnover. But now we have calculated how much they have enjoyed the public education subsidy. And now they have to somehow offset the public appropriation they have received. This is, this is the first time I'm, pro um, I'm uh, proposing this and I would love to hear your opinions. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much. So this was an, an interesting introduction to reflect on the pathway of higher education and skills development in different systems and what this means now for the next level of technology-driven higher education. So I can see you're touching on the points of maybe we need something like a guild, something that uh, reflects the close collaboration between technology industry, fourth industrial revolution industry, and education, which isn't there yet. But you're also touching on the points that um, uh, private sector really wants to see um, more complex skills, uh, higher cognitive abilities, and not just pure, um, what I say, uh, transactional technology skills. Um, can you give maybe, uh, building on your, on your example, mm. uh, do you have um, a good examples of countries which are already building something like technology guilds, higher capacities, the special cognitive skills, um, and, and really um, foster this close industry link? from your research right i um i haven't researched that uh, research that specific aspect but i'm uh, i'm sure there are many um countries and many uh, enterprises that are, that are leading this kind of uh, efforts especially the bigger the bigger ones uh, the bigger uh, multinational companies uh, but the, what i'm trying to argue is that uh, how to establish a system that would uh give incentive or in, incentivize all enterprises to be engaged in this kind of uh, um, skill ecosystem, uh, how to enable them uh, to mm -hmm. feel the need or the oblige to mm -hmm. uh, contribute to such a, to, to the building of such a system. Mm -hmm. okay. this, I, uh, I think that building such a system, I mean, how to create these incentives, probably a problem we know also from other skills, not just, mm -hmm. um, you know, technology oriented. But mm -hmm. is there also a, an, a challenge to convince policymakers that technology driven skills um, uh, uh, need to have a special ecosystem and need to have special regulation and policy environment to foster this industry link? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I think policymaker uh, or government uh, would be a key player in, in this uh, as well. Uh, and we have seen examples of government uh, trying to use uh, um, the tax or uh, levies on, on enterprises uh, to enable them to provide more training to their own employees. Uh, for example, in China, uh, the government increased the uh, tax uh, exemption from 2% to 8% to uh, many enterprises so that they, to, to provide the tax uh, uh, re, uh, deduction uh, from 2% of their total expense to 80% um, of their total income. Thank you. Thank you. I think these are very interesting um, points and we'll come back to you later. Um, please, for the audience, if you have uh, specific questions um, uh, for Pazave, then please drop them there. We'll come back to them later. So um, thank you. So we would like now to move to um, Professor Yun Mok Na and uh, share a bit about software centered universities and how we can integrate software majors with various other majors. I think this is an, a very interesting aspect because at the end, higher education technology is not something that has to happen in isolation, in isolation and has to be integrated in all other training programs. And then speaking from my own experience as a medical doctor, who is also a digital health expert, I can say that I, uh, universities, even medical schools have to really embrace technology in higher education 
and um, and digitally enabled um, health service provision. Just an example from my own experience. So now over to you, please, um, Professor Yunmok, if you can share your slides. Okay. Uh, hello, uh, I'm uh, Yan Muk. Uh, I'm president of Association of Software Center the University in Korea. Uh, and in this talk, I will briefly uh, introduce you uh, key features of Software Center the University in Korea. Uh, this program started from 2015, funded by uh, Ministry of Science and ICT in Korea. And the aim of this program is innovate university, university education, uh, focused on software education, and realize the uh, development of software uh, talent uh, uh, for uh, the uh, uh, target university. Uh, the main uh, focus of this program is uh, development of software talent and uh, enforce uh, industry university cooperation and uh, expand the base of software convergence education. And uh, uh, one of the aim is uh, propagate the value of software to the society. So uh, we have many programs for citizens and uh, K-12 students also. Uh, uh, currently, uh, we have uh, uh, 14, uh, 40, 41 uh, software center to university in Korea. Each university is uh, supported uh, $2 million uh, government fund uh, uh, each year. And this lasts for six years. And uh, in 20, uh, 2020, uh, the 40 universities are supported by government uh, $80 million total. And we have uh, 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 the location of each, uh, each university is uh, uh, separated geographically. And uh, uh, in Seoul, uh, Gyeonggi, the capital area, we have around 10 universities, such university, and we have uh, uh, evenly distributed uh, uh, population of uh, such university in Korea. And in this year, uh, uh, eight universities joined in this program. So the total number of uh, software centered universities is 41 uh, currently. And the key uh, mission of uh, software centered universities is uh, innovate the education system and infrastructure. And uh, government recommend uh, create a, a new college of software. So. Uh, uh, half of the university uh, uh, found a uh, college of uh, software or college of computer science instead of computer uh, college of engineering. And also uh, uh, we uh, uh, built a new uh, admission system for software talented students. And also uh, we focused reinforcing software major uh, capacity. So, uh, uh, the number of uh, admission for uh, uh, software-related majors increased around 2,000 students uh, 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 in total. And also, we uh, try to propagate the software convergence education. Uh, so uh, we uh, recommend the creation of a composite department uh, with a software and uh, another major. Uh, in our uni university case, we created a new department uh, converging software plus law, software plus economy, and software plus uh, contents, and software plus bio, or et cetera. And also, uh, uh, we recommend reinforcing university industry cooperation. So uh, we develop a field-oriented uh, software costs uh, for each department. Uh, and we uh, enlarge the uh, opportunity for uh, industry internship and overseas education. And also uh, we try to spread the value of software uh, for K-12 students and K-12 teachers and uh, their parents and general public. Uh, so we uh, host a lot of software uh, boost camp and hackathon in, uh, uh, in software-centered universities. 
And next slide shows uh, some case studies of each of the uh, mission. Uh, first slide shows the uh, innovation example of university and uh, education system infrastructure innovation for software-centered education. And uh, uh, government uh, recommends uh, merge uh, similar software department to establish a different education system and uh, uh, develop new innovative uh, uh, college uh, focused on software education. And uh, uh, Songkyongwan University is uh, uh, one of the famous universities in Korea, uh, supported by Samsung Electronics. And uh, they uh, built a new college for uh, college of software for software education. And they uh, also support uh, uh, focus uh, open source software uh, education for uh, such a college and and uh, many university uh, uh, create new uh, software process education uh, in all majors and uh, in software centered university every student uh, must uh, must uh, learn basic software education basic software coding skill in all fields including uh, every every student, including medical school or art school, um, every student in our university, uh, around uh, 20,000 uh, students uh, in all major uh, learn uh, basic coding skill and AI and software skills. And also uh, many universities developed a uh, new software convergence curriculum. And the right side of this slide shows uh, the case of Sejong University. Uh, this university is uh, uh, located in Seoul, and they focus uh, they their uh, education focus is content education, and they developed a new department such as uh, uh, department of uh, uh, mechatronics and software and creative software and entertainment software. So uh, they uh, developed many uh, interesting uh, conversions. Uh, uh, department majors uh, uh, in area of uh, movie making, entrepreneurship, and contents, and also uh, uh, half of the uni uh, almost all software center the university put focus on reinforcement of uh, industry uh, university cooperation. Uh, we modernize the uh, software uh, education curriculum. Uh, based on the global standard uh, uh, such as ACM and IT curriculum. And also uh, we uh, try to adopt the uh, demand of the industry uh, uh, to increase the uh, satisfaction of uh, the young people and uh, uh, employers. And also uh, we try to uh, uh, build the uh, real world like uh, uh, working uh, environment for uh, experiment and education. And we also uh, put, uh, we use our uh, government fund uh, to buy the same tool uh, uh, for the students to conduct uh, the same practice uh, in, in their education time. And the right side shows the Kungmin uh, University case. Uh, uh, this university is uh, focused on the mechatronics and car in the industry, they, they have a strong relationship with Hyundai uh, Motors and Kia Motors. And uh, they uh, put, uh, they uh, uh, in, innovated their curriculum for uh, such a uh, car industry. And, and also uh, they develop uh, overseas programs such as ISOF, uh, uh, which is uh, educated by UC, University of California Irvine and also winter vacation boot camp in uh, uh, San Jose area. And also uh, uh, around nine university students uh, joining uh, software center the university go to Silicon Valley internship uh, for uh, uh, around uh, three months or six months or one year uh, 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 by this uh, program. And also we put focus on uh, software value propagation. We operate uh, many software education and experience program for K-12 students, parents, teachers. And also we develop uh, open software curriculum uh, such as uh, open course well and uh, MOOC 
contents for uh, online education and sharing of our education. And uh, from last year, because of COVID-19, we developed to start, we started to develop untaxed software AI coding camp uh, using uh, online uh, uh, tools. And some uh, major achievement uh, uh, in this uh, PowerPoint, the major achievement is uh, the number of uh, admission increased around uh, 7,000 people uh, increased uh, for software admissions and uh, the uh, bottom side shows the uh, increase of number of major students, uh, 26,000, and number of convergent major students, convergence major students, around uh, 20,000, and also uh, the education of uh, basic coding skill for all major students is around uh, 160,000 students. And we developed uh, many course, uh, course uh, and textbooks for convergent software education. And also for industry university cooperation, uh, uh, the number of, uh, uh, we uh, imp implemented this uh, using, uh, by uh, uh, adopting uh, industry university cooperation project and the number of cooperation project is uh, one uh, one point six uh, thousand, and the number of industry internship is one point one thousand, and overseas education increased to three point four thousand. Uh, so, and uh, yeah, le last one is uh, uh, except uh, audi in addition to this program, we have many uh, 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 related. Program such as the Super Maestro program by MC and Innovation Academy, Apple 42 Seoul by MC, and Sweet and AI Convergence Major program and AI Education Enhancement program by uh, Ministry of Education in Korea. And also, we have a commercial software edu AI education service like a Spartan uh, Coding Club and NHN Academy. NHN is like a Korean Google company. and. We also have a programmers.com service, which is very similar to litcode.com of USA. Yeah, uh, that's thank my uh, presentation. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. So maybe one question for you, um, Yun Makna, is uh, what would you recommend developing countries? Should they first converge technology software into their um, traditional programs? Um, or should they first focus on advanced uh, technology education and linking with industries? Uh, yeah, uh, I think uh, uh, we needed uh, the uh, developing country also needed to uh, develop a uh, uh, new new uh, curricul curriculum converging the. Uh, software major and uh, other major. Uh, so uh, university must uh, try to innovate their curriculum uh, to adopt the open source so software education and software tools ed education. And uh, uh, I think every university student must learn at least uh, two or three uh, coding courses uh, uh, because uh, the whole industry is changing uh, by industrial revolution 4.0. So mm -hmm. uh, uh, currently the uh, uh, software coding skill is uh, is uh, uh, math mathematics of, of uh, first industry revolution age. So I think uh, university must uh, uh, educate uh, coding, uh, base coding skill to all students first and mm -hmm. uh, need to develop new uh, convergence major uh, such as software plus bio, software plus medicine, software plus mechatronics, etc. And and uh, uh, in parallel uh, with uh, such efforts, the uh, the university must to increase the university industry uh, cooperation. Uh, and so industry must also uh, use their yeah. some uh, yeah uh, support some fund money to uh, university to develop such a uh, uh, cooperating project. Thank you. Thank you very much. There was a question from the audience um, here um, uh, from the Philippines, and, and that is actually, um, I think it's for everyone here. I'm putting it in already to include the audience, and that is um, most of these efforts aren't inclusive. So what would be the real big change to make sure that 
um, independent from your income level to have access to these more advanced education courses. I leave the question here. Um, maybe you think about it, but I think if we ask now Ibo Paulina to speak, we'll get already some answers um, because um, Paulina Panen, she is really leading some of the greatest efforts on advancing equal access to cyber education and Indonesia is one of the leading countries here. Um, so maybe let's hear from Ibu Paulina, what are the key enablers uh, to address some of the challenges of access, um, access to really high quality education programs and what can we do uh, to collaborate together to take advantage of all of these changes. So um, Ibu Paulina, over to you, please. Thank you, Susan. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, and uh, good evening to everyone. Uh, allow me to share my PowerPoint, please. Can you see? Can you see? Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, the, uh, the topic that I uh, bring up uh, this afternoon is about uh, Indonesia cyber education uh, to prepare for industrial revolution 4.0. Perhaps uh, some, some way it will be, uh, what you call, it will be answering the questions that uh, Susan uh, posed just now. Uh, well, the, the Industrial Revolution 4.0 has been uh, what you call accepted or, or welcome in Indonesia uh, higher education uh, since uh, before the pandemic, uh, especially with the policy of allowing 49% uh, of a university to have online uh, or uh, distance education courses. Uh, to be implemented in their university. So from 100% curriculum, you can have 49% of online courses. And the policy uh, was uh, issued in 20, uh, 2018, but it was uh, renewed earlier uh, last year uh, in 2020. So from that uh, policy, then the new minister uh, of uh, our- One, one quick interruption, sorry, um, Ibu Paulina. There's something with your screen sharing because we see it. We don't see the whole slide. The proportions oh, okay. are. Okay, I don't I know. Stop maybe. It. Yeah, stop just it want first. to make sure everyone can take advantage of your great content and numbers. Okay. Can and what I, what we can see from your first can you coming. See yeah, this is much better. Yeah, excellent. Yes, okay. thank you. All right. So this is the the first policy I, I was telling you, and then from that policy. Uh, our new minister, uh, Nadim Makarim of the Education and Culture, uh, issued another uh, policy uh, supporting the, the 49%. We, we call it the policy of Freedom Learning, Freedom Campus, which allow actually a uh, student for three semesters to study off campus or taking 60 credits hours or 40% of the curriculum off campus. It means that they can do a lot of things there are about eight categories of activities being offered and including online education. And why they are uh, doing this, uh, especially actually the aim is to increase quality of graduates, providing tangible and real life experience, uh, intercultural, international, industrial, community, academic, entrepreneurial, philanthropical experience and prepare them to be entrepreneur and are skillful human resources. So these are the eight uh, activities actually under uh, Freedom Learning Freedom Campus. Uh, you can see uh, a lot of activities here, including uh, the online courses, which is in the form of students exchange or independent study projects. So that's, that's uh, among other. And then uh, uh, during the pandemic, uh, uh, it has been noted that suddenly in 2020, uh, higher education uh, institution in Indonesia suddenly become online, suddenly become e-education, etc. So uh, we found out that the, the what you call the pattern is about uh, like this, like this picture. 75% uh, they are doing it at home, individual or collaboration with teamwork but only 25% they're doing it at, as a face-to-face -face meeting in campus or in school. So that is the basis for the minister to, 
to do the campus opening uh, policy during the pandemic in 2020. And it is repeated in 2021 because uh, we have done some survey. 75% uh, lecturers and more than 40% uh, students are willing to continue online learning and or blended learning. So that uh, goes into the, uh, what do you call, uh, the saying from uh, coming from uh, the statement coming from uh, Anand Agarwal uh, uh, recently uh, last month, he he said that uh, in the future uh, we will experiencing uh, what we see here is that the blended learning mode uh, that is the online and also the face to face becoming together uh, either in the blended or in the fully online and and uh, the face to face uh, separately. So that's the, the situation. And then based on that situation comes uh, the ICE Institute, Indonesia Cyber Education Institute. We, we support the Freedom Learning Freedom Campus uh, with the Freedom Learning for All, with the tagline of Freedom Learning for All. It was so, uh, officially launched in uh, last July. And then we have uh, a lot of partners already, uh, 14 uh, higher education institutions. And then also we partner with EDX, with the local, uh, uh, what you call blended learning courses uh, pool, Espada Indonesia. And then we also partner with MIT uh, OCW, the RELO program uh, from uh, United States Embassy. Caliber for the job market, for example, and we got also support from uh, Microsoft, CloudSwift, and PCMan for the uh, uh, system development, and also from ADB for a lot of events and also for uh, technical assistance. Uh, they are very, very uh, helpful for us. The Indonesia Cyber Education Institute has four missions. That is to provide a marketplace for online courses in Indonesia and to provide equity and massive access for quality online educate uh, online courses through various technology across time and space and to provide flexible learning through unbundled online courses for various purposes formal non-formal upskilling reskilling and it is going to be transferable and we also provide blockchain based learning credential system that is in the future linked to the job market so we are handling the the uh, situation uh, by uh, what you call by uh, supporting the freedom learning freedom campus through the independent study project and also the students exchange uh, framework here is the uh, website of Indonesia Cyber Education Institute. So these are our partner in the middle here. You can see a lot of uh, higher education institutions and also EDX and Caliber, for example. We have about uh, 165 courses from our partners and we have about 1,042 from EDX online campus selections. And we also have from SPADA 970 courses altogether, and then of course from RELO, uh, some of the courses from RELO. So we put it together in one uh, marketplace called ICE Institute, and everybody can just take the courses available for them, and then they will be registered uh, uh, under ICE Institute. At the end of the course, when they finish, they will have, uh, they will receive the certificate, uh, the digital badge is just like this. Uh, there is a logo of the university saying that the courses is taken from that university. And there is a logo uh, of ICE Institute saying that uh, the, the uh, process of taking that courses is uh, gone through uh, uh, ICE Institute. And there is a QR code that can be uh, reusable later on when uh, someone needs to verify the, uh, what they call the certificates. So uh, right now we are moving forward toward uh, the learning journey toward the job market that is to equip our uh, graduates and to support uh, workers with occupational transition. Uh, this, this, is, this strategy has been supported also by the Asian Development Bank. We identified the top industry in Indonesia and we found out although the top industry, for example, is the computer software, uh, but the job demand is different than that. So the job demand, the highest job demand is marketing executive. 
instead of computer software. So that there is relationship, but uh, you know, a different a different path actually. And then when you go into more detail in the uh, skills demand, it's also another story uh, telling by the uh, skills by demand. That is the communication skills. So if you if you match the three computer software, marketing uh, executive, and communication skills, that it means the higher education institutions need to prepare their curriculum as such so that uh, it will enable the graduates later on to go into the job market uh, readily. So however, uh, for this semester, we haven't done it uh, because this study is just new recently. Uh, we finished it uh, recently. So this is the collection of our uh, courses in ICE Institute, uh, the subject areas. We have uh, 181, but the one uh, already being curated in the ICE Institute website is about 124 and is ready for the opening on the 30th of August. And uh, because of that, we are going to do what we call, and the next step is profiling. That is identifying gaps of skills owned by each student to the skills demanded by the job market. Remember that the top 20 skills by demand is communication skills. Like for example, how much uh, communication skills uh, once a students come into your university and if they don't have it any or they, they are lacking of it, how the university can uh, shape the curriculum so that they will be able to achieve that, that skills uh, at the end of their study in the university. So, uh, there is a very interesting article uh, I read about it uh, in the Observer School. After COVID, will digital learning be the new normal? Well, education has changed dramatically and integration of information technology in education, I believe will be further accelerated and that online education will eventually be an integral part of uh, education. It's not going back to the uh, used to be normal face-to-face uh, -face alone, but we are going to uh, have a blended and also uh, more and more uh, online education. It, this is just confirming what Ag Agarwal has already stated, but uh, we cannot walk alone in this case. Uh, so I'm opening the ICE Institute would like to also have a collaboration to make a difference in Indonesia and beyond. Uh, perhaps we can work together. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Ibu Paulina. This, this is a great example how policy plus setting up a dedicated institute has really um, sparked um, the, the impact of um, cyber uh, education and, and higher um, higher uh, technology and higher uh, technology in higher education. I think what you said links very well with what we hear, heard from um, Yun Mark Na, which is now we have to integrate these skills into the regular curricula. So this will be the real um, is a real challenge, but really required. And then I think the other uh, point you made you made is now we have to link with the industry aspect to it more and really create this ecosystem. I think what was also interesting is if we look at current job market demands on advertising, for example, and so on, that's very different from what we want to see in the future, right? If we think about new kind of skills and, and really, um, um, what do you say, more inclusive businesses, socially uh, social enterprises, digital enabled, um, not only e-commerce, e but real problem solving for development problems and challenges and so on. So I think that would be really interesting. How can we drive that with policy? And maybe to um, move to an example how these ecosystems can be established, um, let's hear from Fang Hong Kwat uh, about the work that is happening currently in, um, in Vietnam. And Mr. Quack Quat is an enthusiastic startup ecosystem builder in Vietnam and is really at this interface between startup industry and education and uh, can share some of the examples how um, you are tackling that in the context of Vietnam. So over to you, please. Okay, we um, are you still on mute? Okay. Oh, you're okay. coming. Hello, everyone. Yeah. Can you Good. see the uh, screen I share with you? 
Yeah, we see the screen. We just need you to put it on presentation mode, please. Okay. Okay. Uh, my name is Quet. I'm working uh, for the Ministry of Science and Technology of uh, Vietnam. Uh, so I would like to introduce in brief the uh, how uh, our ministry to introduce the ecosystem to uh, support for the uh, MOOC or the open online resources uh, to develop the in the university and uh, in the private sector. So um, the concepts of the open uh, innovation sharing economy and uh, open online uh, learning education um, brought to Vietnam by some technology startup. Uh, uh, 10 years ago, we uh, begin with uh, ecosystem to boost up the startup uh, in Vietnam. So now the um, some area uh, like uh, agricultural education, e-commerce, uh, logistic, uh, clean tech and uh, medical technology is accept the uh, new model for startup. So now we have uh, more than 3000 startup in, in, that's in this fields. And uh, we have uh, 10 startups worth more than 100 million US dollars and uh, two unicorn that uh, value more than $1 billion in Vietnam. So uh, the uh, uh, education, uh, the EdTech uh, landscape in 2021 is uh, remarkably uh, very good uh, um, progress in the uh, ecosystem for startup. Uh, many software for learning at home uh, and uh, mm, uh, some open learning uh, program is also published on website from the uh, kid uh, garden, uh, childhood education, uh, elementary school, um, and uh, middle and uh, some higher education so and so publics in, in this field. And to training for work uh, for students, the last year the student in university and so uh, participate in, in this market. The uh, foreign language uh, training centers and the, the center for training enterprise and employees also adopt some uh, new ways of education. Uh, and the uh, LMS, SAAS and other tools is now uh, become more popular in, in Vietnam. And uh, many mentor network, venture capital and agencies and so introduce some new model uh, in Vietnam. So um, the progress of the, our ecosystem can divide into five stages. The first one, uh, 20 years ago, we begin the research and uh, the uh, pilot application of the uh, uh, open online resources in, in Vietnam. And um, after that, uh, step two and step three, um, maybe 15 or 10 years ago, the first uh, model on uh, education tech, e-learning product, uh, appeared in Vietnam, uh, both by, in English and in Vietnamese. And, uh, and then the uh, step uh, three is the booming in quantity of the number of projects on uh, education techs. The, uh, um, elementary, elementary school and also in higher education also appear the software for online learning. More than 100 projects is appear in this uh, period. But uh, all most of them are free because it's a kind of pilot project. And uh, you know, five years ago, uh, the state forum in begin that uh, we uh, we see that the people, the client, are ready to pay for using the online platform. So I think it's a very good signal for the, this market. And so also venture capitals and some uh, um, investors also uh, put money into the uh, ad tech startup in Vietnam. And uh, set five appeared on uh, by uh, um, COVID-19 uh, two years ago. So also the selection of the good uh, project can survive and expand to the university schools in Vietnam. And the EdTech e-learning now is again more pop popular in own ecosystem. 
So um, how we design the ecosystem for the education technology startup, we uh, now we uh, would like to combine the education and training with the advance of the uh, 4.0 science and technology uh, to fill the gap. The purpose is to fill the gap uh, in education and training uh, between the uh, market demands and the traditional providers. And uh, we would like to uh, um, transfer the knowledge from the private sector, from the uh, technology company to the university, schools, and society. And uh, the third one is uh, the demand driven approach is that uh, uh, we focus first one on what the um, market need, the pupil uh, can pay for the online education. And uh, uh, the first one is focus on commercialization. Uh, our expense uh, focus on the commercialization of the project rather than the research uh, as we done before. And uh, we need some um, platform to connect uh, the uh, human resources from different sectors, both private sector cooperation industry is not only uh, the resources in within the uh, university and school. So the uh, um, entrepreneur can be the trainer for uh, the young uh, talents in university and school. And the last one is uh, we uh, propose uh, the uh, apply the uh, uh, 4.0 um, technology uh, AI and uh, blockchain is very good tool to uh, develop the uh, open resources uh, for the technology startup company. And here is the way we uh, design the uh, platform or ecosystem for uh, open innovation. Uh, we the third the open is quite different from the closed approach before. So the mindset of the leader of the university, schools, and industries should be changed. And the leaders of the policy makers of different ministries so and so should be changed to open the mind and to accept the new model uh, for the de development. And uh, the platform, online platform, uh, uh, should be created to be to make available for all a stakeholder in the ecosystem can use and exploit each other. And, uh, and here is the mindset of the uh, prime minister, so and so support by ministers uh, of different uh, ministries. So I think it's very good uh, approach for the open innovation uh, ecosystem in general. And uh, uh, within this uh, um, Ecosystem, the open online learning is one so and so the part important part of this ecosystem. And uh, here is the doctrine we follow uh, right now. We are proposed the uh, Vietnam Open Innovation Platform to support for the open innovation ecosystem, uh, both internal and external uh, technology resources could be used to. Um, exploit it in this platform and it provides for the, the learner, for the client, for the partner, not only inside the university or school, but outside the private sector, the center uh, within Vietnam and outside Vietnam. We need the more resources uh, available. We can uh, make the open network to own university or a private sector in, in the region to make uh, the really open innovation platform in Vietnam. Okay. Okay, here is the design, the, uh, uh, our platform, the open innovation challenges, uh, open innovation marketplace, innovation showcase. And here's the important part is the training incubators, accelerators, the you know, startup hub in own university and colleges. And uh, MOOCs, and uh, we are also integrated in the open innovation platform uh, by different manners. 
where we invite the trainer from different industries, uh, private sector entrepreneur to be the trainer uh, for the uh, innovation and entrepreneur training course, even higher education in university. I myself also um, become a mentor for the uh, national university in the subject of innovation and startup uh, entrepreneur. So that's uh, on uh, my uh, initiative to create the ecosystem for the open innovation platform in Vietnam. Okay, thank you very much for your listening. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Quad. Maybe one quick question to you. How do you measure the success of this initiative and program? Oh, I think the, uh, the measure for uh, this program is the, how the feedback or response from university uh, both public and private sector. And now we have the more than uh, 20 universities um, and uh, the private uh, seems to be more active than the public one. But uh, I think uh, step by step, we will expand our uh, partner to the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. So new partnerships is one of your success factors, especially from industry. Thank you. Um, let's go first uh, to the questions we are receiving from the audience, and then let's hear from our ADB experts some of their views and reactions and, and sharing some of the work that they are seeing across the region. So we have here uh, a question from Dr. Rakesh, who is saying, how can they, from he's an um, executive director um, at an institute in India, and he's asking uh, Ibu Paulina, how can he be part of it? How can you kind of gain partners across the region and, um, and socialize more what you're doing? Maybe uh, uh, you can answer that quickly. Sorry. Oh, we can't hear you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, to have partners actually is not easy, uh, but uh, we believe that uh, our work is for the greater good. That's one thing. So trust among each other. Uh, it was like door-to-door -door, uh, marketing, uh, Susan. It's just like uh, going from one institution to another, saying that, okay, this is our, uh, uh, what you call, institution, and we would like you to be part of, of, of us, and then please contribute. And then at, at this uh, time, for three years, the government is supporting everything, so... Uh, everything is for free. We, we don't exchange any funding at all to, uh, to our partners, etc. So the, the support is from the government as well as from the ADB. So, uh, you know, it's just like a big, a big picture of, of vision and uh, sharing mission uh, together for our country. So that's, that's, I can say, because there's nothing else, you know, we, we did the public, uh, what we call public uh, exposure for about three years about the idea. And finally, we got the, the partners that would like to join us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think you're making an important point that is it is a public investment um, and, and government has to stand behind it and provide um, some funding for it to establish it, to gain partners. Um, and to make it, of course, also freely available. And I think this uh, brings us to the question from the audience where uh, someone is asking um, how developed countries can support developing countries to benefit from um, their learnings on how to drive uh, the fourth industrial revolution and how to build the skills. And maybe we hear from Mr. Yun Makna from Korea, uh, being in a developed country in Asia, what you think a developed country can offer to developing countries and accelerate the progress made in technology for um, higher education. I think uh, uh, to support developing country, uh, the developed, uh, developed country can uh, maybe support uh, some uh, fund first and uh, I think uh, they needed to uh, build uh, some education infrastructure, uh, computing infrastructure for uh, smart learning, distance learning. So they needed to uh, build some their own data center or they uh, must use some cloud service from global company. Uh, so a developed country can support such uh, fund for education, uh, building infrastructure first. And then next stage is uh, 
uh, supporting uh, uh, contents for education. So uh, in, in in our country, uh, we have a, a K K MOOC Korea MOOC site, uh, which is operated by the government, and their their contents are uh, highly. Uh, uh, they uh, spend a lot of money to build a very uh, uh, good uh, uh, high level education contents for uh, 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 online education. And we have around 1,000 free, free online uh, courseware. Uh, uh, the uh, lecture is done using Korean language, but uh, uh, all KMOOC have uh, English caption. Uh, so I think uh, every uh, uh, developing country can use our KMOOC uh, online courseware, uh, and they cover the uh, area of industrial revolution technology, and also AI technology, and basic science, and linguistics, and software coding technology. So I think uh, from our country case, we can uh, we have a. a, 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 a Foreign minister supports some um, uh, supporting program for developing countries. So using uh, that aid program, I think we can uh, provide them some fund to build their education in Prague. And so also we can support that English captioned uh, online KMOOC course for for their uh, job uh, development. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. So what you're saying is content. Developed countries can share content. Uh, they can help to contextualize it. And of course, um, maybe there is a need for grants to build the infrastructure and to, the capacity to set up institutes like the one um, Ibu Palina is uh, presenting. I'm looking here, um, there is another question about, a lot of questions about industries. Like how do we really create incentives for industries to collaborate? And, um, and maybe we hear from uh, Mr. Ha Wei a bit more because China is doing really a, a formidable job to um, create these incentives and, and maybe some reflections on that. Sure, uh, sure. Um, uh, co-financing is another uh, approach. We talk about um, tax incentive and co-financing is also bed spread and delivered uh, using different modules, uh, models. Australia, Denmark, Finland, and Germany provide direct funding to employers in the form of a grant or training vouchers. Um, but update, uptake um, by enterprises varies uh, across, across countries. Um, uh, Austria, Canada, uh, France, and Italy take an indirect route uh, to funding of uh, employee uh, training through tax allowance and credits, exemptions and reduction. Uh, this is, this is um, uh, in line with uh, what China is doing. Um, and the more uh, widespread model of co-financing is the levy system adopted by countries such as Singapore uh, and, and the South Korea. Uh, China has implemented, uh, as I mentioned, the tax-free uh, employee training uh, expenses uh, for uh, up to 8%. Um, and there have been a number of uh, different types of uh, subsidy programs um, uh, by Ministry um, of Human Resources and Social Security, and uh, where, whereby in, in, Guang, uh, in Guangxi Autonomous Region, the, the Bureau of Human Resources, uh, they issue coupons to employers to spend on the training of their workers. So there are a variety of ways. Okay, thank you. So incentives, incentive systems, uh, levies, um, grants. Um, I know Singapore is giving grants to um, mm. uh, foreign companies to come in and train local residents, uh, for example. So there are various models yeah. um, that exist already. So um, I think with that, we would like to expand um, the group here and invite, uh, please, our ADB education experts, um, Mick Young and Rio Toro, uh, to share and reflect uh, on what you said and share experience from um, their own uh, work um, in ADB. And of course, also uh, before they joined um, ADB, maybe a bit of background. Rio Toro Hayashi is a senior sector, a social sector economist. He works in the South Asia department and 
has many years of experience um, supporting higher education projects in uh, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, and before joining ADB has been with various um, uh, multilateral agencies, World Bank, JICA, and so on. And uh, Mek Yong Chin is an education specialist in our sector secretariat where the community of practice sits. And um, she is supporting innovation and um, new approaches to higher education across the bank. So maybe, um, Ria Toro, if we can hear from you, what's happening in our South Asian countries with our support and how do you uh, reflect on what we heard from our panelists? Yeah, thank you very much, Susan, for uh, my introductions. And the, uh, I, I can hear like a very nice presentation from all of the speakers. And I would like to make uh, uh, comments on three aspects. The first one is enthusiasm from the developing, developing member countries. The second one is I also wanted to talk about the risk involved. And number three is the new opportunity I can see. The first one, the enthusiasm. Uh, we hear great uh, presentation from Indonesia, Vietnam, uh, Korea, and Huawei from China. And the, but this is not happening only those countries. Uh, I'm in charge of South Asia regions, as Susan introduced. And the Bangladesh is now establishing digital university, for example. And it's been operating uh, for, for the first few years. And the Sri Lanka is also thinking about the virtual university. So uh, uh, as Dr. Na mentioned, like a software center, the universities and the Eve Polina's uh, cybersecurity uh, education institute and open innovation platform uh, mentioned by Dr. Farm is all relevant uh, for thinking about this new mode of uh, university establishment, not necessarily with the physical uh, university campus. So we, we, we got a lot of like uh, insight and we will definitely uh, take advantage of those existing ideas and how we can build on it. And at the same time, I also see great opportunities for or those, you know, or digital education for small countries. Uh, I'm also in charge of Bhutan in the Tibet context, but the, you know, small countries may not have uh, uh, this much of like a high quality contents and the qualified uh, teachers, professors. But the, uh, when the uh, COVID-19 started, uh, EDX actually provided free licenses for, for developing countries and Bhutan was one of the countries uh, uh, harvesting these opportunities and the nearly 5,000 5, uh, people enrolled in the EDX program and there are uh, not many people actually but the, there are several people at least who is like taking more than 30, 40 courses within a few months time uh, EDX course and this may change their life trajectory by accessing this world-class uh, contents. And the, so small countries has also a tremendous opportunities to tap this uh, digital education opportunities. And the, with respect to the industry university partnership, uh, as how I mentioned, like uh, in the case of Germany or UK, they have developed this, you know, or university industry linkage for, for, for a few centuries, uh, you know, so it's not easy to establish such kind of a uh, good relationship with, uh, between universities and industries. But for example, I'm also supporting, you know, a virtual job fair in Bangladesh and the Sri Lanka. Uh, bdjobs.com is the largest Bangladesh, you know, or, uh, job matching site. And there is a topjob.lk. Uh, this is also a, a biggest, uh, you know, job matching site in Sri Lanka. And they can even easily like mobilize hundreds or thousands of uh, companies for, for for facilitating job matching. And recently we organized like uh, uh, virtual seminars for, for agriculture in Bangladesh and the virtual you know, or job matching seminars uh, in, in Sri Lanka. And the, it's quite easy for universities to access to employers through this kind of uh, virtual job matching site managed by private sector. So by collaborating with the non-traditional education actors, such as you know job fair, uh, I mean job matching companies, and so on, uh, we, we have tremendous you know opportunities to rebalance the education balance sheet, as Huawei mentioned. There are many different ways to contribute through this platform, and the, I can see you know. Many many uh, opportunities and the enthusiasm, enthusiasm from the developing member countries for, for taking advantage of digital education. Ooh.
So mm-hmm. that's the first point. And the second point, the risk. Uh, most of the MOOCs, uh, digital education course, are kind of a biased in IT related course because it's easy to teach IT course online because you know, by using computer, they can also do the hands-on practice. But the just teaching IT itself is not going to contribute to the economy because most of the IT industries in developing countries are still nascent or small. And the developing IT industry up to like a level of, for example, Korea uh, is quite, quite difficult. It, it cannot be done overnight. So, so we have to think about how we can apply those IT technologies or digital technologies or post industrial revolution technology into the areas where developing member countries has an advantage. For example, I'm in charge of higher education project in Bangladesh and the, we are preparing, for example, or high-tech agriculture university project or smart textile university project. That's good because, examples, right? Yeah, yeah. on, on how to, to mix it, yeah. Right, right. So, so there are like uh, you know areas where uh, developing countries has advantage, and the, we should probably invest more heavily yeah. on IT, uh, considering those advantages. The yeah. last point, uh, new opportunities. Uh, you know, for example, Ivo Polina like uh, establishing very innovative uh, ways to deliver education or remote islands in Indonesia. And why not we can do it for the Pacific countries and or mm-hmm. like mountainous uh, areas in, in Bhutan or Nepal. So I think, uh, you know, having this uh, kind of platform can open up the new opportunities for regional corporations and this can be further looked into. So, so those Thank are the uh, comments of observation from my side. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. I think this is great reflecting on number one more software driven education across sector themes. Then you said you need to have a dedicated institute and responsibility to create these marketplaces. Uh, The digital technology creates great opportunities to bring various universities in. And then the role of uh, partners like ADB to fund the public goods aspect of sharing this material across various countries. I think this is very much also to Aibu Palina's point. So now let's hear from Mac Young, uh, please, a few reflections um, uh, on what has been discussed and how we are taking this forward. And then we are going to a last round to hear from each panelist. Uh, thank you so much, Mrs. Jan. Thank you, thank you for a kind introduction. Yes, my name is Mi Young Shin, Education Specialist in Education Sector Group. Uh, thank you so much for introducing uh, four innovative story, case stories uh, in Asia. So uh, digital transformation, uh, as our panelists commented, that uh, digital transformation is uh, affecting industry and services throughout the society and is requiring the higher education change to innovate, uh, improve adaptability to the changes and the improvability for industry structure change. Truly, uh, adaptability and improvability is very, uh, the very um, priority priority thing of value in ADB ADB project. We need to improve. Uh, we expect uh, our students get a job after higher higher education, and they, we expect them they can adapt to the social change continuously. And I would uh, appreciate for uh, innovative cases, your country's attempt and journey. Yes, yeah, so through our uh, through today's presentation, we heard about uh, how the uh, China and <coughs> China and South Korea is changing to um, accommodate their higher education to the industry demands, and how Indonesia and Vietnam applying their digital technology uh, quickly and adaptively uh, to expand the access and innovative education. Uh, if I we can if we can share a little bit more about four countries, China has experienced huge development in higher education pop, uh, reputation for twenty years, and we've we've known, known that their uh, uh, focus their uh, focus on industry cooperation industry cooperation is very huge high from the education sector and the research sec- research area, but as the as uh, as uh, as audience mentioned, more and more uh, countries and universities realize that we need the industry cooperation, but it is really difficult. It's really difficult. It costs our effort. It, it, not, it 
uh, it, it costs the government to support and sometimes financially and then lower and financially. So to uh, improve the industry cooperation, we need more uh, support and it's, uh, definitely the university side need to uh, try our best to get the industries, uh, industries the environment to our education. And the Korea's, uh, Korea's case, the software-centered uh, university is a very, um, uh, we can learn how, how South Korea government uh, strong have a strong initiative for change digital uh, education. They trying to uh, 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 grow, raise the high quality software developer, but they want to increase the more uh, all of the society areas uh, talented with include the computational skills. Then I realized that the social uh, atmosphere has been changed with the government and only adoptively faculty members in university. So right now the university education change has changed the K-12 software education as well. It can be a very good uh, example. And actually in Indonesia, it's another, it's one of the most innovative country in digital education. And ICU is a very, really innovative uh, attempt, especially the blockchain technology. I think re, uh, education area, we are left behind it to adopt the new technology, but I hope every country and every uh, university think seriously adopt the new technology to make students and make company um, uh, easily find uh, a good talent and then get their job easily. And in case of online education, we have a problem, the mutual cognition is a higher education area. We always have a, a qualification recognition issue uh, between the country. So for um, the online education area is a new emerging area. So we need to, countries uh, need to discuss with this issue, how the standard and then uh, the agreement of the, between countries and to open to, uh, to open the classes to other countries. So we, I, I hope um, ADB can uh, contribute to this, uh, this movement. And Vietnam mm -hmm. becomes, yeah, Vietnam can be suggested the ecosystem, the startup nurturing is more, more really, the, uh, as well as industry cooperation, startup is really important issue. So we can, we can expect uh, Vietnam can show the evidence that uh, how EdTech can contribute to our student achievement. And uh, experts said that uh, digital, uh, digital transfer digital technology can uh, broaden our gap between the country, between the university, but they show the possibility that we can uh, short uh, bridge the gap. So um, I think it's time to governments or uh, policymakers and universities, uh, the faculties, uh, time to think about seriously how they can make up a strategy to using um, digital technology for their priority mm -hmm. industrial area. And thank you. I think, yes, thank you so much. And thank you, Mika, it's a very comprehensive. Yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah. For that, uh, I would ADV, ADV want, uh, AD, from the AD, uh, international organization, we, we can uh, we can make, we can provide the expertise and network, or we can pre prepare the platform or a network, universities, uh, university can cooperate. So we did, that's the another issue we can, uh, we, we can continuously uh, talk about. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Megyong. I think we have here another question from the audience, and I would like to invite the audience to use the last chance to um, share thoughts and questions through the question and answer function with our experts. And that is here really, and maybe um, let's invite um, Ha Wei, because you reflected on this also, and maybe let's do a last round for everyone. Very quick, your, your last thoughts, your ask, what's your big dream and mission, vision for the next um, couple of years in technology and higher education? But one question here is really, how do we 
provide also these skills that make our graduates more employable, you know, through micro courses, micro courses, um, the softer skills that are required. Um, so maybe, um, Hawaii, if you can respond to that first, uh -huh. and then we go around with your final uh, statements on um, your uh, kind of um, views for uh, technology and higher education and what you need from development partners like ADB and the community in general. Yeah. Uh, this question about the uh, macro and the nano courses, I think they are not necessarily in conflict with the existing uh, education model. In fact, they, are, they will be complement or supplement to the existing curriculums uh, within higher education. Um, uh, th therefore, um, I, I believe uh, that, um, through this uh, through this education balance sheet I, I was talking about, maybe some of this can be uh, customized by certain uh, uh, companies uh, so that uh, they they will um, customize some some courses uh, on particular job relevant uh, skills for the university students or graduates to to learn from. And uh, coming back to the final words, I think. There are great potentials, having listened to all the panelists um, and, uh, and uh, Lutero and Mikon, I think there are great potentials in leveraging technology to improve the access, quality, and the relevance of higher education. But we also need to keep in mind that uh, uh, the use of education technology could also ex uh, exacerbate existing digital divide within the society. So uh, maybe there, there is a role for ADB, uh, multilateral donors, to uh, to play there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, let's hear from uh, Mr. Yun Mak Na now, please. Maybe you can touch on the closing okay, the digital okay, divide. Yes. How would uh, you close the digital divide? Uh, uh, we are trying to uh, uh, build the competitiveness of the student. Uh, uh, also, yeah, uh, our software center, the university, are also contributing to digital divide of, of people such as female uh, uh, whose ca career is interrupted. And also, we are trying to educate uh, uh, public uh, area uh, sector people and even the army. Uh, so, uh, I think we contribute uh, to. Uh, uh, reduce the gap of uh, digital divide. Uh, and also, uh, as a final remark, I, I would like to emphasize that uh, 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 industrial revolution and digital transformation uh, requires software AI skill to everyone in uh, all area of industry. So we are preparing college students for such a change. And software center, the university program is uh, physical plus digital, and we uh, focus industry demand driven education. Uh, so we educate uh, college students to open source skills and software AI skills to every major student. Uh, and as a final remark, I would, I would like, I think uh, uh, internally in Korea, we need to provide industrial uh, competitiveness and uh, a greater uh, change uh, job opportunity to uh, the university student and externally uh, our, uh, Korea and other uh, uh, developed countries need to help uh, developing countries. Uh, and we have uh, uh, quite a lot of fund, uh, uh, ODA fund in Korea. So I think this ODA fund can be uh, utilized for uh, improving uh, uh, that industrial revolution education and digital education and sharing of KMOOC uh, to, to develop developing countries. Thank you. Thank you very much. A very important points. We need this multi-level leadership and leadership also from industry. I think that's a good takeaway. And um, this important point you make, um, really, it's about higher level cognitive skills. So that has to start very early. And we have to be re uh, recognizant of uh, the importance of um, lower education also to um, to drive that. So maybe, um, Ibu Paulina, you can share what is your ask? How do you accelerate the partnerships you need uh, to drive the work forward that you have uh, established already? Thank you, Susan. I think uh, the first thing I would like to uh, ask for everyone, uh, and also ADV is to support uh, collaborative efforts among the 
you know the universities and countries uh, so that we can have more by collaborating uh, uh, we cannot do it everything by ourselves so we can we can do the balance like uh, how we said uh, but uh, not only from industry but also from developed countries to developing countries so the balance will be three columns how we instead of two columns <laughs> and then the other thing is that uh, if possible, uh, we can speed up the policy for uh, to support this transformation because this transformation apparently is something new for all of us, and we are a kind of uh, you know hesitant if we are uh, walking on our own without any legal standing, without any policy supporting our efforts. And the other one is, uh, of course, uh, we need uh, readiness and capacity of our user, the user, either the teacher, the professor, the lecturer, and also the students uh, themselves. Uh, readiness means a lot of things and capacity means also a lot of things. And we were, we noticed from the, from the, what you call from the examples when we started uh, the pandemic, uh, uh, going through online courses, uh, we were just kind of stumbling everywhere. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, you, Paulina. I think you really emphasized the silver lining of the pandemic, but you also say we are in completely new territory everywhere in the world, so we have to work together to create anticipatory policies for the future that we want to see in technology and higher education. So um, with that, uh, with the note on anticipation, maybe Pham Hong Kwat, you have the last words on your dream uh, ecosystem that you want to see um, yeah. where industry and university and users come together. Yeah, thank you very much. I, uh, our team have a big dream to uh, make the um, open uh, innovation platform happen really in Vietnam soon. So we have the young generation to improve and to re-educate by finding um, 4.0 technology. So um, this big dream, but uh, we lack a lot of uh, resources, both the content program, training program, the trainers, the uh, technical system, and uh, the, the network for our platform. So uh, we hope that all uh, speakers, commentators today to join this forum can be our partner, our sponsor, and ADB is a, a good uh, connector uh, to help our dream can uh, be happen soon. Well, thank you very much. Th thank you very much. Um, great closing. And I can see here from one participant, there is a very specific ask um, for ADB to create such a community of practice and uh, foster this collaboration. And with technology, obviously, this is now a lot easier. There is one last question and I want to give justice to this and this is um, how to adjust and align universities, curricula, academia, school policy. Um, okay, so this is, okay, this is a complex question. I think this requires a whole paper. So I do call on the, on the um, organizer of this conference to provide a good summary of this conference which answers all these questions from the, uh, from the audience uh, here, especially the last one. With that, um, I think what we can say is that there's a real disruption and transformation from factory-like education, how we know it, you know, students sitting next to each other in rows, and we've seen this uh, hundreds of years, to now a very distributed networked education system that then connects people brains and minds and hopefully unlock creative spirit of everyone um, in the world to solve the very complex problems that we have while making a living of it and with that I'd like to hand over to Joost he has a few announcements about marketplace next sessions and I would like to thank all of the panelists for a very interactive and spontaneous interaction really enjoyed it I learned a lot and I'm looking forward to staying in touch please join us on LinkedIn on ADB's knowledge and innovation platform thank you Thank you very much, Dr. Suzanne Ross, for this very interesting and information-packed session. And thanks to all the panelists for your uh, preparedness to answer all these questions coming in.